A major piece of turf history was sparked in 1966 when Lavinia, Duchess of Norfolk, had the brilliant notion that 27-year-old John Dunlop was just the man to take the helm at Castle Stables in Arundel. Since then, and until the present day, he has exerted a quietly determined influence on this sport, his name synonymous with a broad span of success, from classic and Group 1 winners to carefully conceived handicap victories in this country and as a pioneer abroad. He was the first man to train for the Mactoon family and remains a keystone in Sheikh Hamdan's powerful operation. He even repaid the Duchess's faith when training Moon Madness to win the 1986 St Ledger for her. He is, quite simply, one of the fundaments of horse racing and this is a celebration of his continuing and enduring achievements. These boxes here, of course, are the original stabling for the castle, which is, you know, it's just a hundred yards down there. And these big wide gateway, these big wide archways here were the carriage houses, you know, you can see what they were for. Mm. And they've been adapted as the stables um, over the years inside. But that's what those great big archways are there. And how long have you been here, John? I've been here since 1963. <laughs> <laughs> Which is a long time ago, and I first had a license here in the autumn of 1965. Um, which again, a long time ago. And you feel that the Duchess sort of took a, a hunch with you, didn't she? she well, she, she really did, because I wasn't very old then. Um, and I think uh, Gordon Smythe, I think, had decided it was time for him to move on, and he went to Lewis and took over from Tyser Gosden, John Gosden's father, mm. and immediately trained Charlotte down to win the Derby. That first year he was there, and I was Gordon Smythe's assistant here, and uh, I was given the opportunity to take on as trainer. Um, and there weren't a huge number of horses there. There was something in the region of between about 50 horses in those days. Mostly, well, mostly the 90% of them belonging to the Norfolk family, mm. and one or two very close friends. It wasn't really a public. Well, it was a public stable, but it wasn't. If you see what I mean. And when it was it part of your sort of business development that you made it more public? I think so. I think probably too the advent of, of well having some successes and winning the Derby with Shirley Heights and things brought my name to people's attention, and one was asked to train more horses for more people, and we built more boxes and expanded the whole thing mm. bit by bit by bit. Mm. And when you first started, was it the confidence of youth that allowed you to sort of, because it's quite a big thing, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it be? was. And huge support from the Norfolk family. I mean, that was the, that was the great thing, you know, which did make life, made life easier for one, you know. Mm. Yes, I think you're probably right, yes. And how about your um, kids? Because obviously Ed and Harry are. Yeah, they're both training. Now. Poor things. They've never given the opportunity to see any other sort of employment. I don't <laughs> think actually. No. Harry's um, Harry's got a is is finding things tough. You know, he hasn't got very good horses and battles away. But he's a really really hard worker. He and Christina, his his wife, um, and I just hope they can get a good horse and really develop from there. And you think that's the key? If you get a good horse and show what you can do, then things... You, you do need it, don't you? You do. You do. Because it's all very well, you know, if you've got cheap horses. And he, he'd been very well supported by owners of mine and various other people who've been very loyal to him. But they are the second-rate horses, to be perfectly honest. And you've got to be very lucky for those cheap horses to come good and, and really come good. You know. Do you think it's harder as a trainer starting out now than it was when you started out? Uh, awfully hard to tell, isn't it? There are so many people who start off, don't they, really? And, and you have huge successes with some of these young trainers, and I don't know, just able to make comparisons, really. Uh, coming back to your um, sons, you've spoken about Harry, you haven't um, mentioned Ed, who's, who's had some great success and recently put in quite a bit of investment, hasn't he? In, he certainly in his has, he certainly market. has, yeah, he certainly has. And had a bit of blow when he lost all those horses um, last autumn, you mm. know. Um, but for whatever reason there was, I don't know, it never seemed to be made clear. But no, he's trained those two fillies quite superbly, really, and internationally, in the way they've competed so successfully over and long careers, both of them, mm. actually. And it's no fairy, well, hopefully it might not be over, although I feel the worst, personally, but um, she obviously had a pretty major tendon injury, but it's repairing, apparently, and they seem very bullish about the future for her. Mm. But he's done a wonderful job with both Ouija board and with Snow Fairy. Yes, yes, he has. Yeah. And, yeah. and but that, that investment is, you know, you, it's quite a risk, isn't it? Uh, it's, a big, it's, a big ri it's a very big risk, too. And then suddenly, if you're, you know, if you're paying off from bank loans and so on and so forth, mm. and then your income is suddenly reduced by 35% or whatever it was, mm. um, 
you know, it, it's a bit, it's a bit of a blow. But he seems to be shrugging it off and soldiering on. And you, I mean, did you give him some advice on that? Because obviously, over your the, the time that you've trained, your CEO is coming. no. Go. I would have. I'm, I'm my financial acumen would be virtually nil. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah, really. Yes, really. <laughs> so who? Keeps all this this afloat then. <laughs> the good God above, I think, probably. Hopefully, may it continue. Uh, the more then, how about how about temp, temp, advice on temperament? Because you know, as a trainer who's trained over a long period of time, you'll know that owners come and go, that fallouts happen, things well, that's take place. Well, that is exactly right. Because once had the same sort of thing, but it, with him in this particular case, it was such a, such a major part of the oper operation was suddenly sort of cut off. You know. Um, but you do, you lose owners and owners change their mind and owners fall out with you for some reason or another or you fall out with them, so it's a fact of life and can't be avoided. But no, he took it all very well actually. That obviously, it was very unfortunate the way it was done, but anyway, I think it's, it's history hopefully now. Yeah, yeah well, hopefully it will be. I mean, yeah. he's, done, he's done so well. You've seen a few people come through your yard as well who've gone on to be successful trainers. Mm. So Jeremy Nasida would be yeah. one, Gerard yeah. Butler, and yeah. Simon Christie who's obviously yeah. gone on to racing, yeah. being race manager yeah. to Sheikh Mohammed. And a few that happened too. <laughs> a few that have started training too and haven't, hasn't worked out, you know. Did you think the ones that have succeeded? Did you was it obvious that that, that Germany was going to see that Jared was going to succeed? They were both they were both hard workers and and fundamental lovers of racing. I think too both of them in different in different ways actually, but they were and um, and they both proved very successful. Yeah. Jeremy came from a, a completely non-racing background, didn't he? Yeah, totally, totally. Yeah, in a London family and. No, not involved in racing at all. And you gave Simon Christopher his first job as well? Yeah, I did. I did, yeah, I did. Jeremy and he were here together at the same time, actually. And were you conscious of having quite a sort of table, a stable of the talents at the time then? So that you had quite uh, a... I don't know. One's, one's had a lot of assistance over the years and some good, very good ones too, mm. actually. But those two were both were particularly interesting. And how about uh, Marcus Hosgood, who's your racing secretary? Yeah. Because he was somebody that you introduced to your operation. What was your thinking at the time that you wanted to employ him? Uh, I have no idea. I can't remember. So long ago. Well, was it a case? Of, I mean, because he was a uh, basically he worked on the Evening Standard, wasn't he? he was a tipster. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, did, did he bring something to the operation that? And he worked for race forms well, um, and he has an inherent knowledge of the racing calendar and the racing program and so on and so forth. And he's been a huge advantage and a huge help to me for all these years. Um, but there aren't that many people who, who are so closely involved as he might be, you know. It was an amazing opportunity for him as well, I'm, you know, I'm sure we'll talk to him about it, but to be asked along to, to, yeah. to do that role. Yeah. And of course he lives not very far away, which is and always has done, for, I say always has done, has done for some many years. So is he, I mean, how do, how do you work out between the two of you a horse's campaign? I mean, what, what's the process? Uh, the process is obviously we try and establish what our ambitions are. And I, when I say ambitions, what we hope that, that the horses can achieve, and, and look for the right sort of route to go along to try and achieve this, to to achieve these objectives. Um, and obviously, one has to establish things like the going preferences and the distances that can be most appropriate, and then finding their level really, and finding their level at which they can be successfully competitive. Because that's what it's all about, really. And yeah. does he sort of leaf through the foaming foam book and provide you with options? Yeah, exactly, exactly that, exactly that. Um, and of course, it's the, it's, it's, the, it's the moderate horses are the difficult ones mm. to place. You know, the good horses find their own route and, 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 and name their own races, really. But it's the ordinary horses that you've got, to, the ordinary handicappers, you've got to try and find the right sort of opportunities. And how do you go about ascertaining what a horse's distance is? By trial and error. Pure and simple, on the race course. Because here we don't work any horses really beyond seven furlongs, whether they're two milers or whatever, uh, which probably goes for most trainers actually, and I think mostly you do find it, you've got to prove it on the race course. So you, um, you obviously you could use the family to some degree as a, as yeah. a clue to yes. what they I might mean, obviously, want. Obviously a pedigree is, 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 one, is one element, but, but, but fundamentally some horses surprise you, they stay further than you would think, and others don't stay which they should, when they should. So and how do you watch, watch race? In, in time, if I'm thinking about a moderate horse and trying to find the, the right race for them, do you watch a race live, is that how you ascertain it, or do you go home and watch it again on the video, what's the, what's the process there? I think it's a combination of things. It's interesting to have comments from the jockey at the time who can help you, and, and they very mark you. 
um, but the good judges are very helpful and very useful to be able to tell you what they think is the right thing to do, the right trip the game might be, the level of competition you're, you, you're aiming at and not be too ambitious and so on and so forth. And of course, comments of Marcus and oneself and experience, really. You are you are a trainer who who likes using handicaps, don't you? Even with your good horses. I mean, you were talking earlier today about how you think horses that might even have you know group pretensions, you're going to run them in the handicap because you can exploit a handicap mark. Some trainers don't do that. What what is it? You know, what what's your thinking, your method, I suppose? Well, it's 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 pretty obvious, really, that if you receive weight from other horses, you've got a better chance of winning than if you're running at level weights. Could that not be true? Of course, but why do some trainers think, I've got a good horse, I'm not going to run it in a handicap? Well, it depends how good they are, isn't it, really? Do you think it, it, if they're on, on that stratospheric level, it's obvious? And of course, if, 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 they, if they have established a, an attractive handicap mark, they obviously haven't proven themselves as good horses. Mm -hmm. So they've got to prove it, really. So you use it as a proving yeah, ground as well? Yeah, so. no, most definitely, I think. Right, we'll progress. OK. Good. Thing about, the thing about horses and racing is nothing is nothing's ever black nor white, ever. You know. Very difficult to, to really make clear cut decisions about anything. In fact, usually if you're ever dogmatic about any particular thing, you're always proven wrong. Mm. And you can make, you can think I've got that right at a stage. Absolutely. And then time will show you yeah. that actually it was luck yeah. or but coincidence. Do you know that horse you were talking about this morning with extraordinary condition? Every year you've got one or two cases of something that comes up that you've never heard of, never been described to one, and the veterinarians have never seen it before. It happens every year. Even now? Even now. It is extraordinary. After all these years, it is. They're strange animals. <laughs> and some pretty strange people, too. <laughs> Who has been, who was your favourite owner to train for? Oh, well I have to say Lavinia Norfolk because she was my great protégé, I was her protégé rather, and, and, um, and if, without, her, without her and her support in the, in the early days, nothing would have existed as far as I'm concerned, you know. And she was an extremely nice woman too. So yes, but I mean lots of people over the years, Sandy Struthers, but he's been a great, great friend for forever and ever and ever. And had some very good horses too. Mm. And how about how do you find um, training for Sheikh Hamdan? I mean, he's got the great thing about that operation is that it seems to be very coherent, sort of breeding wise. I mean, it must give you a lot of pleasure to get horses from families that you know well. It is, and he, and he is very good in that way. That, that uh, you should, you'll probably find if you look at the breeding of these, all these Dubai horses that have arrived, they're all from, from immediate families that one's trained in the past. You know, there's a, there's a Thawar kid. Um, I forget which one it is actually, but and there's a half sister of Saki, mm -hmm. for instance, and the mare is now 22 or 3, I think, and once I've very few members of that family, her, her bodies over the years, which is so nice. Um, <clears throat> no, he's very good in that respect. Sadly, I mean, one has to say that the, 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 perhaps the production of his studs have been disappointing over the last few years. Um, compared with maybe 10 years ago, you know. What do you but think? Things, well, I don't think there's any partic particular reason. Um, possibly the stallions he's been using of his own have been relatively disappointing, some of them. Uh, I mean, Nashua was a disappointment, really, as a great racehorse, but a disappointing sign. Mm -hmm. and, and that took up a lot of the good mares for quite a number of years before it was appreciated, before it became obvious that it was, that it was a disappointing stallion. And that can happen. It happens to every every major owner breeder, mm -hmm. I think. You know. Conversely, is there any stallion of his or any stallion that you think has been rather underrated and not given the opportunities that perhaps he should have done? I don't think so currently. No. Mm -hmm. Had you thoughts about that? What no. Uh, no. I, I suppose um, the obvious one from in Ireland that I was thinking of was High Chaparral, but that's beginning to be righted now because there was so much sort of focus on. That's not his thing. No, I know, I know. No, I meant, no. I meant more generally yeah. there. But no, no, I hadn't really thought about, about no. Shit Hanban's um, 
specifically. Uh, Nayef, I suppose? Nayef, well, Nayef went through, through a phase that he wasn't particularly popular, and then suddenly he did become very popular and was full, and suddenly he declined again in popularity, rightly or wrongly. You know, people do, are very much conscious of sort of fashion with stand-ins at times, you know. What do you think of Nayef? I think he's a pretty solid stand-in, actually. I think he's a pretty solid stand-in. He hasn't had a top, top horse, I suppose, yet, has he, really? No. And how about Saki? Well, he's been disappointing, really. I mean, but the two good horses that I trained were well, not the only two, but, but Saki and Bari, you know, father and son, mm. both excellent racehorses. And Saki, a fantastic racehorse, really, but few forget how good he was when you look at his race record. Mm. And he has been disappointing. Um, oddly enough, he's never been patronised widely by the MacDoom family, actually, I don't think. Mm. Mm. We obviously used him, but, but not, not as much as you perhaps would think, considering what a superior racehorse he was. I thought when Saki Secret came along that there yeah. might be a sort of flood in behind Well, I'm, maybe it'll come, I don't mm. know. It could be in the pipeline now, possibly. Mm. But it doesn't appear so. Do you have a favourite stallion at the moment that you particularly like your...? Oh, you and another horse, of course, has done very well with yeah. their homebreds, actually. Mm -hmm. um, he's just retired now, he's had a good career, mm. particularly with, with his fillies. I was just I was just wondering whether you whether there was any particular stallion whose progeny you like I mean are, are particularly I don't know honest or you know just particularly good from your point of view the horses that you get I don't think particularly so at the moment no I don't think there is really I mean Shamadel and Dubawi the two sort of young stallions of particular note at the moment mm -hmm. Oasis Dream just a generation behind those two and they are probably the leading lights mm -hmm. at the minute actually I think one could say pivotal mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And those four stallions have been very widely used, and Invincible Spirit, of course, and again was, was trained here. Um, and they're using those four, four or five horses, I say they, I mean the Macton family yes. generally, because they really are the leading lights of the younger generation. Mm. I mean, the whole thing about stallions is really only one in ten is really very successful. That is a fact, too. And not necessarily the most brilliant horses, like you were saying about Nashwan, will become the most brilliant stallions. No. Sort of... no, they don't. I mean, historically, they, they never have been, I'm afraid to say. You know, so many top, top race horses haven't been good stallions. Whereas something like Sadler's Wells, like, you can kind of understand why a horse like Sadler's Wells became so dominant, because he was so sound and so yeah. dependable and yeah. reliable. And, of course, that amazing male line, too, mm. of Northern Dancer. I did want to ask you about um, jockeys, because obviously Richard Hills has recently retired and yes. Paul Hannigan has taken over as Sheikh Hamdan's uh, rider. Now, you've, you did once have a stable jockey way back, didn't a you? A long time ago, probably before you were born, I think. <laughs> An Australian called Ron Hutchinson. Mm -hmm. I've heard of him. You've heard of him. You've heard of him. I, heard of him. I, I don't know anything about him. So he was a charming man, <laughs> delightful when, man. When was he here? Um, when I first started, so he was riding here in probably the early 60s. Prior to that, Scobie Breezy rode for the stable for two or three years. Um, but really, it became the situation, there weren't that many top jockeys that were, that were available if you wanted to retain another one. Mm -hmm. And there's no point in retaining somebody you haven't got sort of real confidence in, you know. Mm -hmm. um, you really want to be feeling if you've got a sort of seven to four favourite for the Derby, you know you're happy to put your stable jockey up. But if you're not, you don't really want one like that. And you felt that none of those people were available? Well, they weren't really. They weren't, as it so happened. There were more retained jockeys in those days, I think, than there are now, mm. actually. Mm. There aren't too many people who actually retain a jockey or pay a large retainer for a jockey. Um, yeah. I, admittedly, the Mactoon family is a rather different. There are not too many other people in the same position, are they, really? No. I mean, I think Carlos Abdullah retains a jockey nowadays, does he? Richard? Well, he's dabbled with it, hasn't he? He did. Well, Richard Hughes rode for him mm. for a while, didn't he, for a couple of years. Mm. But, um, but there aren't too many people otherwise, other than the Mactoons, that anything could do. But through dint of having so many horses for Sheikh Hamdan, you quite often saw well, Willie exactly. Carson. Well, Willie, was, Willie well, I was awfully lucky, really, because Willie Carson and Pat Edry, between them, and rode something like a thousand winners for me, you know, the two of them, between the two of them. Brilliant. <laughs> which is amazing, really. Um, but neither, well, Willie was retained, obviously, by Dick Hearn and, and then by Hamdan and saw the combination of the two, and Pat was retained by various people, but they were always available for a good horse, you know, usually, mm. you know. And Leicester wrote a few good winners for me too. Wrote an Oaks winner and a Coronation Cup winner and things too. And you had some warm words to say about Richard Hills after his uh, Well, I know. Time. He's an awfully nice, young, I can say young man. He's not all that young now. You did he, say young man in the paper. I thought I that think was really I, no, I think I did. I think I did. <laughs> <laughs> all things are relative, aren't they? <laughs> um, but he's a very nice man to work for and marvellously polite always and, 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 and uh, 
and I wish him well in the future, really. He struck me as tremendously professional. Yes, he was. He was terribly good. He always on the telephone, always rang up for you know to talk about a race prior to the race, and always rang up afterwards to discuss the horse and discuss how the race was penned out and things. Couldn't have been nicer. Couldn't have been better. Paul Hannigan, I don't know very well. Everybody speaks terribly highly of him, mm. and obviously his, his riding record is, is, is splendid for a young man like that. You know. Absolutely. Yeah. He's. Uh, I think. I think he's the ideal. Yeah. Um, absolutely. For uh, Sheikh Hamdan, I think that's a really absolutely. good combination. Absolutely. Because he's used to being a stable jockey, and that it's kind of like that, isn't it? it is. Riding for Sheikh Hamdan. It is. It is. It is. There are there are downsides to it as well. You know, you can suddenly be sent off to go to Pontefract to ride one when you're doing Ascot or something because there aren't any runners, mm. um, and that's why it's always been a difficult job, particularly being second jockey in a retainer situation. You know. Which so Willie really Seppel and Ty Gaucher. Yeah, well, exactly. It's, it's a tough job for mm. them actually. Cause they they literally I do get sent off to Pontefract for one ride. Mm. You know. Um, no, I think Paul Hannigan is a real plus, a real bonus to the operation. Prior to this, had he ridden much for you? No, no, very little. He wrote, ridden quite a bit for Edward, son Edward. Mm -hmm. um, but no, he might have had the odd ride or two, but not, 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 not much, because he was mostly in the north, of course. Yes, yeah. Generally, generally. But had he come to your notice in terms of his riding? Oh, well, absolutely, yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. And he's um, he was a champion jockey two years consecutively, mm. isn't he? Can't do much more than that. And do you, you don't have jockeys coming down to ride no. work, do you? Why is that? Um, well, because there was not... If you had a retained jockey, there was an obvious reason to do it. There's not much point in coming down to ride work and then they can't ride it on the track. Mm. It's as simple as that, really. And I'm not sure on the whole that stable lads and, and jockeys always mix or work well either, you know. <laughs> One wants to try and beat the other, whichever way around it might be. Now, the last person, last jockey, Willie Carlson never rode work here, ever. And neither, neither did Pat. The last jockey that rode work here was, was Brian Rouse. Really? Yeah. He rode for Philly Corps quick as lightning. Who won the guineas, won the 1,000 guineas. And he came round a rider here, because he'd never ridden them before. Because I think, I think Pat had been riding, and he, and he was claimed to ride somebody else in the guineas. And then somebody else, the second, who had also ridden them once, also got claimed. But that's, that's the downside of not a retained jockey. And Brian Rice, bless him, was, was the sort of last, last, last choice, if you like. <laughs> so we got him down here to ride work, which he did, and he, and he rode a winner, which was great. Well, it all worked out nicely yeah. in the end. Yeah, it all worked out nicely. I bet Paul was expecting to come down here, wasn't he? Because I know that he's been working hard. We were speaking to him early on Racing UK earlier this year, and he was saying that he got all the files out, printed out by his wife, and he was going yeah, to like all the been very businesslike about the whole thing, yeah, yeah I'm sure he is. Well, we'll see. We'll see. If, we'll see if there's something worth coming down to ride out. Right. We'll see what happens. And it, does it bother you? I mean, for an important race, if the jockey has never sat on the horse before? No. Not if you're using top top pen. I mean, if you have Olivier Pellier riding for you, would you be worried if you hadn't sat on it before? No. No. Some wonderful fiddies. I mean, Salsa Bill was a, a fantastic fiddy. You know, do you remember her? I do remember Mel Salsa yeah. Bill. She's one of yeah. the reasons why I love racing. Just yeah. an incredible fiddy. Yeah. When yeah. tell me about you know when you first saw her and, and realised that she was good. Oh, I suppose as a two-year-old, and for some reason we had we had a hiccup with her, and she couldn't run. And wherever it was, we'd sort of chosen to run, and we finished up running her at Nottingham, I think, first time up. You know because we'd run out of opportunities. And then it became obvious how good she was. And she went on as a three-year-old, as you know, and she won everything. Was it a straightforward three-year-old year for her? She was, yes, it was, until the, until the arc, funnily enough. You know, she won the Guineas, the Oaks, the Irish Derby, the Vermeer, and she was hot favourite for the arc. And oddly enough, she had a just a slightly suspect blood picture prior to the arc, and, and we thought, well, we we can't not run because of that. It was just a bit of a sort of deterioration in the picture. And she, I think she's just gone, actually. She's had a long, a long, long year, actually. 
Not a very big, you know, she had lots of quality, but not a very big figure. No, she was charming. And how bold a shout is it to go for the Irish Derby with a filly? I know, it's a, it wasn't my idea. Um, it was Sheikh Hamdan's, actually. I can't remember why we decided to do it. The only funny thing he wouldn't do, he wouldn't run her in the King George. Which looked like an obvious one. Look, she looked like a good, good thing for the King George, actually, but he didn't want to run her for some reason. I think actually Mohammed won it, didn't he? It was something not very exciting. I can't remember what. Can't remember. But the other really, really, really good filly I had was Habibti, mm. who was a sprinter, mm. and laughed about it on last Sunday because I ran a horse in that charity race they had. I don't expect you were involved, but the. Um, Countryside Alliance had a charity day there, and they had a they had a um, charity race. And Guy Lander rode a, ho rode a horse of mine. I provided for them, and they ran seven furlongs on the round course. And Habibti ran, I think, it was six furlongs on the round course because they had a drama on the straight course at Ascot. Right. You don't remember that? No, I don't know. I think it was her first race she ran. It might have come at first race. I think it was actually. It was the Virginia Water was one of those ones, you know, and for something that happened, there was a subsidence or a burst drain or something on the straight course, and they had to do it on the round course. <laughs> <laughs> and that's how she started off. Then she won the Loud, then she won the Moy Glare. And she was exceptional, actually. She was, really was exceptional. And the, in terms of your colts, who do you think was the, the best of your colts? Do you know what a very vague horse was Posse? Would you remember him? He was the one that was unlucky in the Guineas, wasn't he? He was. Nuri had knocked him over and, and duly lost the race as a result. But, but I think he would have just about won the Guineas. And then he won the, the St James's Palace and he won the Sussex. And he didn't run again. Um, it was very much a commercial thing. He was whistled off to start. But he was a very, very good horse. Not particularly attractive, a disappointing stallion. A short career at Dersley Wood in Newmarket and then went to Japan. Um, didn't do particularly well in either mm. sphere, but he was a very good racehorse. And how by Forley, by Forley, who was by Aristophanes, who was by Hyperion. And how about Shirley Heights? Because when you're sort of starting out and you you get a, a very good horse, it always strikes me as you might be a little bit nervous about how good he is and will you do the right thing and. Was that how it was? Well, it was a bit with him because um, it was, and it, and it so it proved in the end, actually, because, um, you know, as a two-year-old, we ran him quite early. He ran, he won the July meeting, but he'd run twice before that, you know, so, and he was a, you know, he was a, a Middle Reef, you didn't expect me. Well, Middle Reef himself was precocious, don't mm. forget. He was a Royal Ascot two-year-old winner. And he wasn't very big, but he was very strong, very powerful little horse. And he took a long time to get the weight off him. He was a fat little thing. And he came good and he won at the, at the July meeting. And then, of course, he won the, the um, Royal Lodge. Um, and then the next year, he was big and fat again. He got well beaten first time up in the classic trial at, uh, at uh, Sandown. And then he won the Dante like a really good horse and won the two derbies. And then sadly went wrong because I wanted to run him with that. <laughs> One of the biggest worries was the Irish Derby. It belonged to Lord Halifax, old Lord Halifax. And he didn't really understand the Irish Derby. You know, it wasn't very important. The Derby, obviously, the St. Ledger was a Yorkshireman, obviously, very yeah. much a Yorkshireman. <laughs> so the horse, you know, the St. Ledger was anything that really mattered. But we managed, the Duchess and I, Lavinia in Norfolk, and I managed to persuade him to have a go at the Irish Derby. And he won by the narrowest of margins. And we all thought he got beat from when we were watching it. And oh my God, we, don't, we, we really have done the wrong thing now. And then sadly it went wrong after that, uh, and we couldn't run him again. Mm. But Pro proved a wonderful stand-in, amazing stand-in. Uh, again, that must have been great to yeah. see, have his progeny Lovely. coming too. Wonderful. Uh, well, could you? Did he stamp his his progeny? Could you? Could you tell there? Uh, I think he did. Yeah, he did. Uh, but he was, he, you know, yes, he did. I suppose he did. Yeah. Yeah. And how about Erhard, your other Derby winner? How would you characterise him? He was a he was an interesting horse actually because he wasn't very good as a two-year-old. Nothing went really right for him as a two-year-old. He liked fast ground, and the ground never seemed to come right. We ran him in Horace Hill, I think, finally, um, having won a maiden at Red Car, actually. Beating Piccolo, amongst other things, in very fast time, strangely enough, over seven furlongs. And as it proved subsequently, it was a very good performance, mm. actually. Um, but as a, as a three-year-old, he, he, he wasn't showing a huge amount in the spring. 
Um, and then we ran him at Newmarket. He was very unlucky to get beat in the field, and I think it was, or you know, one of those early trials for every mark. And then he won the Dante like a really good horse. And he won the Derby like a very good horse too, actually. He did. Yeah. Is it unusual to be able to get a horse to the Derby at all, let alone win it, if they're not really showing very much in April? You would think so, yeah, but I mean, Shirley Heights wasn't showing anything much, you know, he need, needed or had to have a race to get himself fit enough, I think, really, you know. And so that, is that just down to sort of trainer's instinct or trainer's knowledge to think, oh, this horse is actually very good and I'm persisting Well, Shirley Heights has shown as a two-year-old, actually, he was good when he won the Royal Lodge and he, he did come good and he was maturing and getting better all the time, and then he wintered too well uh, and took a long time to get himself fit again, <laughs> get him fit again. How about your St. Ledger winners? Your favourite must be Mood Madness, surely. Well, he was a lovely horse. He had a wonderful 3 0 career. You know, he won his maiden and he won a little handicap, another handicap, and he won the King of George, a fifth handicap, and, and then he finished up winning the Ledger. And he was a lovely looking horse and a, mm. and a, and a most attractive, nice personality, a nice character, too. Yeah. Silver, Patri Zona. Silver Patriot was a great, mm -hmm. I was a great fan of his. He was a grand, big, tough horse, you know, and really enjoyed himself. And a bit unlucky in the derby. A bit unlucky in the derby, beaten by a bad horse, too. <laughs> he was. He Time was. has shown that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Willie Ryan's great moment of glory. Good luck to him, Willie. And how about Millenary? He was a good horse, you know, too, and a consistent horse, and he had a very good career, actually. I mean, he won a lot of races. He won just short of a million quid, you mm. know, which is, is a lot of money any day. The Moon Madness because of the connection yeah. with, with his yeah. owner. Yeah, exactly, exactly. exactly. Well, the other interesting horse was, and, and, and was an important horse, was Ragstone, who won the Ascot World Cup, mm. owned and bred by the Duke, and he died, the Duke died, what, two years later, and he was then Her Majesty's representative at Ascot. And, and the Ascot World Cup to him was sort of probably more important than practically anything else, you know. And that was great, and there was a, sort of a, a big plus time, you know, when things do, do, do go right. Do you think you have an affinity with, for stayers, or do you think you, it, it doesn't really matter? I don't think it matters, to be perfectly honest. Um, I've had a few good fast horses, you know, Habibti was the best of them, probably. One of the Vernons with what? Aragon and... You've had Invincible Spirit as Invincible well. Invincible Spirit, he won the Vernons, yeah. yeah. He was a good sprinter, top sprinter. No, we've had all sorts. Don't really mind what distance they go, if they can <laughs> win at that sort of level. <laughs> Don't mind at all. If Colts sort of, or fillies. If you're casting around your yard at the moment, your best horses are Beatrice Aurora and Time's Up? Probably say. are. Uh, probably on pure ratings, they undoubtedly are, I think, yes. Mm. We could just hope there's a three-year-old here that might come up, you know and improve, um, but they need to. So we're going to leave these here just walking and we'll go back down and see the two girls come back up again. Okay. And, um, and then they're going to withdraw and we'll continue. What is the horse recently that has given you the most pleasure then to, to train? Recently? Yeah. What do you mean by recently? In I suppose I mean in the last 10 years. In the last 10 years. Because we've reminisced a lot about the horses you've loved to train further back than that, but is there any, it doesn't even have to be a, a horse that ended up being your highest rated, but one that, that you feel particular satisfaction from Well, funny, I've had a lot of satisfaction, really, with, with Time's Up, the horse that he won some nice races last year and he won the November Handicap, a very valuable year before and uh, owners of mine that I've had for many years, and, and they, they did win the cad draw, actually, with his brother, give with, notice. Give, with Give Notice. Um, but they've been very loyal and very enthusiastic, and, it was, and it's great to see them happy and them enjoying it and, and, and being involved with the same old men. They bred them all themselves, you yeah. see, too, which is so encouraging. So and, and you've got so many horses like that. I mean, you've bred so many, you've trained so many of horses that are quite you know, closely related to others. Like Holliston Times would be, yeah, yeah. Would be a, yeah. another one where you've, bred, yeah. you've trained lots of the family. Yeah, I've got a nice three year old, actually. Have you? Full brother. Mm. Name mm. of? Harleston Wood. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Well, I look forward to seeing him. He yeah, ran once last year and ran well. Ran at Newmarket just once and ran well. I look forward to him winning a 12 felon handicap sometime in August, maybe. Maybe.
Vi fik godt lukket i vores alt, ikke? Lovely. What strikes you about being most different about training now to com compared to training, say, in, even in the 80s or, or the 70s? Well, I think the worst, the worst thing at the moment is, of course, I know it's, a, it's an old chestnut, but it's, the level of prize money is so appalling in comparison with the cost of everything, which keeps on going up and up and up and up. You know? And it is awful when you sit, sit down and look at the prize money at somewhere like Yarmouth over the weekend. and. Very valuable horses running for less than 2,000 quid to the winner, you know. And do you feel com confidence that the British Horse Racing Authority, those people in charge there, are going to work towards a workable solution on that? What is, what is a workable solution? Well, I think that's the problem, isn't it? It, it, is, is. it is. It is. I mean, all racing throughout the world is financed by off-course betting through the machine. Isn't it? I mean, there is no other country in the world, I don't think. I mean, Australia has that wonderful combination of, of, of off-track um, totalizator betting and on-track bookmakers, which seems to work exceptionally well. But every other country in the world is dependent on, on very mutual betting mm. to finance their racing. And I don't know what the future is going to be here, really. We've given away the tote. Mm. We've lost that, which is disastrous. But how it could be avoided, I don't really know. Uh, the bookmakers go offshore. Um, how, how is the betting industry going to finance racing? It's not, actually, because the big bookmakers are all public companies. Mm. And their, their first call is to their shareholders, obviously. Mm. So I don't know what the future is going to be, to be perfectly honest. And you, you, you are somebody who's, who's played a keen part, really, in the, the, the structure of British racing. I mean, you served on the patent committee. Yeah, and you've, yeah. you've, you've done... Yeah, I know. I'm now being retired, though, but from everything. So I'm <laughs> far too old to be involved and have an opinion any, any longer. Yeah. I, I thought it was a bit rough, really. I mean, uh, how do you feel about that? Would you have liked to have carried on? Um, well, I enjoyed I enjoyed working racing welfare, and I was involved with Stabler's Welfare Trust for 30 years or, so, or more, and, and the racing school for 25 years or whatever. And I've enjoyed seeing them develop. But they're big operations now. The racing school, as you know, is, is, is a major operation, and, and racing welfare and the Stabler's Welfare Trust originally, I mean, it was on a shoestring, and now they've got a portfolio worth X millions and things. It's a different ball game, really. Mm. But uh, you know, you you show no intention of retiring from being a, a racehorse. Not though, as yeah? yet. Not as yet. No, not as yet. But so um, I mean, you know, it's, it, why why should you retire from any other aspect of? The well, football? I don't know. I think you, you you after a while you're involved with all the politics and things come round and round and round and you've heard it all before and. We might be having racing for change now, but we, we, we've seen all these suggestions crop up over the last 40 years, really, yeah. truly. And there comes a point that really all you're interested in is your own operation and your own friends and your own family, indeed, involved in the sport, mm. more so than the big picture, I suppose. Which perhaps is selfish, but one feels one's done it all in the past. Yeah, well, you've, I think you've, you've, you've contributed a lot, haven't you? What did you make of the British Champion Series? first time around. We've had a year of it now. It involved quite a lot of disruption to the pattern in order well, to bring it Well, the series, I don't think, is such a thing as a series, quite frankly. It's this original pattern that we've had over the, for the last, it has developed over the last, when did the pattern, when was the pattern initiated? 35 years ago, whatever it was. Um, Champions Day was a huge success, but it was fortuitous, to say the least, that we, A, had Frankel, we had fantastic weather, and competitive racing throughout, but you could well see it was a filthy, poor, wet day and not, no real superstars. Uh, unless you open the gates and let them in free, I don't think you'd have got the crowds that we got last year. So you think it's still got something to prove? It well done on your first year, but... Well, exactly. I would say exactly that, yeah. Yeah. And what, just to change the subject slightly, what do you think of Frankel? Everybody's raved over his three of years, some fantastic performances. You've seen many great horses during your time training. Yeah. What do you think uh, of him? Well, interestingly enough, there was a comment in the paper today, I think it was. I can't remember who wrote it. I had a quick look at the racing place this morning about Brigadier Gerard. When you think of the horses that he beat um, during his racing career, well, Frankel hasn't really met those sort of horses. He hasn't had that sort of competition. Um, that the mill reefs and the seabirds and thing had in the past, you know. Um, I think he's a fantastic horse. He's a marvellous physical specimen too, and a beautifully bred horse too, and beautifully trained by Henry. 
Um, but whether he's a really up there as a super superstar, I don't know. He's got presumably he's got to prove it. He's as a four-year-old as well, hasn't he? Well, he has. Yeah, he absolutely has. Of course, he has. Yeah, but he is unbeaten after all. Mm. He hasn't looked like any beaten. Okay. Well, except that day at Ascot, he looked a bit um, <laughs> worrying for a first try, didn't it? <laughs> it is. The performance in the 2000 Guinness is extraordinary visually, quite though. Extra, quite extraordinary. But it looked sort of freakish. It didn't look quite like the sort of real thing. You know, you'd like to see horses who are controlled and under control and quicken and show that wonderful acceleration. We hadn't quite shown that. He's a sort of flat-out galloper somehow. Although I think he was getting more restrained and more refined as, as the season went on, perhaps. I was about to suggest the Queen Elizabeth II stakes. Yeah, yeah, you think exactly. that was a more sort of substantial... I think it was. And this year will be fascinating, actually. I hope there's enough competition around to, to, to make him... to prove him, really. Now, it's interesting that Sir Henry Cecil wants to go up in distance as yeah. well, which will be another thing that Brigadier Gerard had, yeah. a versatility of distance. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. No, it'll be most interesting, fascinating. I was interested, I was rereading uh, this week uh, the um, Horse Sweat and Tears book that you did with, with Simon Barnes. <laughs> yes. what, was that, what was that like to do? <laughs> well, of course, it's slightly, it, it always suggests that Simon Barnes lived on the spot for a year or so, <laughs> which of course he didn't. But uh, he's a very nice, do you know him at all? Yeah. He's a very nice man, yeah. actually. And he got quite involved and he really enjoyed it all, actually. I think he, he thought it was quite, quite fun. You could see him increasingly rooting in his writing for, <laughs> for Team Dunlop all yeah, the way through the book. Yeah, I know, I know. It, it was entertaining. But I was interested in the fact that you wanted to do it because you thought it would be good for racing, didn't you? You thought it was a good way. Is that way. what I said? Did you I? did say that at the time. Do you think I meant it at the time? <laughs> I don't I've know. No did you read it? I don't know. I've read it, certainly. I have read it. Yeah, I have. And, uh, and I quite enjoyed it. It was quite amusing and, 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 he, and he enjoyed it. And, and I think the book was quite successful. What it achieved in the in the big scene, I don't know, not much probably. I thought it was a good, it was a really good book. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, I've good. read it twice now, but good. and I thought you you gave your staff sort of platform to, to well, speak. Well, he was very good. Simon was very good at that, like that. You know, he went in the horse box with them to the races and things, and got involved with the staff quite closely and things. Um, and no, no, it was, it was a pleasant book. I suppose I, I suppose I was thinking that you thought it would be. You know, I, I wanted to get at how you felt that you wanted racing to be something that people could access, and is that something that you still feel for racing? You wanted to make it more widely accessible. That that struck me as quite a modern thing to do well, I at don't a know. time I mean, when it's race, trendy racing now. Racing is widely accessible as long as you can afford it, isn't it? That's the essential truth of it, isn't yeah, it? It is. And it, and it probably is expensive. Well, it is expensive, but so are most entertainments expensive, actually. Well, the great thing about vet racing, yes, is you always hope that you might just have the, the best horses ever appeared on the English turf. Mm -hmm.